morning, Justin. Morning, Prof. Liana. Hi. Hello. How are you? It's Everybody less hot is... nowadays. It's less hot? Yeah. Raining now. Goodness. Yeah. Thank good. Thank God. <laughs> oh, that's that's actually good for us. The rain finally stopped and we're getting some nice days. Yeah. It, 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 it comes to us. Yeah, it came to you, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, haven't seen Dr. Flavio yet. Still checking. Yeah, there he is. Hello. There he is. Flavio. Hey, Flavio. Hello. Justin, oh, there you are. Hi, Justin, how are you? Nice to see you there. Sorry, I'm on driving, so I'm just going to listen today, but we're recording, so we're all good to go. Thank, okay. thank you, Flavio, for joining. Pleasure. Yes, okay. hi, Prof, it's all yours. Okay, very good. Um, I just, it's a continuation from our last discussion about uh, management of colorectal liver metastases, and um, I had asked Dr. Roca to speak to the general topic, but also to the topic of hepatic arterial infusion. He and his partners here are experts, actually, when it comes to hepatic arterial infusion, one of the few centers in the country. And uh, it's a method of liver directed therapy for colorectal liver metastasis that may not be amenable to resection or ablation, or there is a future plan for that. So I really, um, I think we can learn a lot from his expertise. Um, and I thought it would be of interest to the group. And um, I introduced him a month ago, but again, he's the head of the division of surgical oncology here at OHSU. He's also the um, a surgeon's chief uh, of for the Night Cancer Center um, and um, a dear friend, extremely knowledgeable and an excellent surgeon. And he will be visiting you in November with me. And um, and I'm looking forward to his talk today. Thank you, Flavio. Great. Well, thank you, Liana, as always, for the kind introduction. And of course, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, virtually, and it'll be even more of a pleasure to come in person in November. So as we're hand hammering out those um, those details, let me just we take good care of you. Thank you. Oh, great! Thank you. Let me just share my screen here and get things in presenter mode. And then, do you guys see my slides without the notes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Perfect. Sure Wonderful. Um, so before we get started, I just have a, a quick question. Is everybody familiar with hepatic artery infusion? HAI pumps? You can put your hand up in the chat or is it something out of left field? Uh, what do you know, and Sumit, do you have any familiar with this procedure? I mean, treatment? Okay. So you have some some knowledge and experience with it. I don't have that in some way hospital right now, but I believe that there are some in medical school. Okay, great. All right. Well, why don't we just dive dive right in? So, um, this is kind of a diagram, you know, showing you a little bit of what uh, what the pump looks like. And as I tell patients, you know, it's it, it is like a port and it's not like a port. And so, but it's a, there's some important considerations to think about. So, um, yes, chemotherapy goes through it, and yes, there's a storage capacity for chemotherapy. But unlike a port, it's a much bigger device. It's about the size of a of a hockey puck. Um, again, I don't know how much hockey that there is in, in Thailand. It tends to be more of a, a winter sport, uh, but just gives you a sense of how big how big the disc is, and. The reason, and you can see the diagram there, and I'll go into a little more detail about where we put it and why we put it in certain places. Um, but um, the reason it works is that, you know, as we all know, the liver has a dual blood supply of both the portal vein and the hepatic artery, but the liver metastases, as well as primary liver tumors, actually derive their blood supply exclusively from the hepatic artery. And so this is why it allows us to give the treatment through the hepatic artery. What's more, um, 
favorable for the uh, for the pump is that because the chemotherapy is going into the liver, it's getting extracted and metabolized. And so, for example, the drug that we use in the pump is called FUDR, which is a 5-FU precursor, and it gets converted to 5-FU in the liver and concentrated up to 400 times. So imagine multiplying the dose of 5-FU. Oh, you lost the slides? Can you guys see the slides? Yeah, we lost them. I don't know why. I was seeing oh, them weird. and I lost them all together. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me, let me see if I can share again. What about now? It's okay now. I can see no, them. Okay. I can Perfect. see this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so we were saying, so the dose gets concentrated and then none of it actually leaves the liver. So all the dose stays in the liver, nothing goes systemic. And so that's the real advantage of it. And then because as we talked last time, about up to 50% of patients with uh, colon, mesthetic colon cancer will have some disease in the liver. And for uh, a significant number of folks, the liver may be the only site of metastatic disease. So I know Dr. Sickett has kind of went over some of the rationale. And so I just wanted to really cover all the different indications where we use this. And so certainly I think folks are most familiar with using this in the first line therapy for unresectable colorectal liver metastases. But believe it or not, it can be used as second line, third line after progression on systemic therapy. And in fact, the HAI pump therapy has significant response rates, even in the third line setting. Uh, as you may, may be aware, may not be aware, it was actually first studied in the adjuvant setting. So we'll go over some of the initial papers that actually looked at its use following liver resection. And probably the most exciting for us as liver surgeons is, can it be used as neoadjuvant therapy to downstage patients or convert patients from unresectable to resectable disease? What I won't cover today, but perhaps we can do that if there's interest um, at a later point over in, uh, in Thailand, is how it's also being applied for primary liver tumors, like cholangiocarcinoma, which is my, um, one of my research interests. And so maybe we can save that for a different day. Okay, well, what are the pros and cons? Because everything's got a, a good thing and a bad thing. So I mentioned a bit about the increased response rate. I also mentioned the fact that we can convert patients to resectable disease, particularly with those that have a significant liver tumor burden. Oh, anybody have a question? No. Um, and then I'll, as I'll show you, there's actually randomized control data to show demonstrated um, improved survival. Of course, the disadvantage is, is that you do need uh, an operation to place the device. It is a little bit finicky as far as catheter maintenance um, and uh, there are, there's the potential for some significant complications, particularly either vascular or biliary, because that is the one um, side effect of giving the high dose chemotherapy through the hepatic artery is that even though the liver is perfused dually, the bile ducts are not. So the bile ducts are also only perfused by the hepatic artery. And so that's where we have to be very careful when administering the, um, uh, the disease. And of course, because the chemotherapy is given to the liver, it does not treat extra hepatic disease. And so I think part of the issues when this technology was being implemented is that it was not given with systemic disease. And at this point, we pretty rarely give it alone. We always give it with systemic therapy unless we have good control and then just putting patients on maintenance therapy through the pump. So that said, that is one of the relative contraindications. So small volume extra hepatic disease, small lung metastases, are typically okay. Um, if folks have peritoneal disease, though, peritoneal carcinomatosis is usually a contraindication for pump therapy. Because of the need to put the, um, the catheter into a specific artery, typically the gastroduodenal artery, folks who have aberrant arterial anatomy may not be candidates just based on their um, vessel distribution. And so it's very important what we do here at OHSU is get a, a dedicated HAI CT scan which is a, a CT angiogram to really look at the size, distribution, uh, and patency of vessels. And then patients who already have pre-existing biliary strictures or obstruction, we're always a little nervous um, to put a pump in because again, biliary strictures is one of the potential side effects. And so we don't wanna potentiate any issues there. A relative uh, contraindication is previous radiation therapy. So whether they've had 
yttrium 90 or external beam radiation. Again, because of the potential for hepatic toxicity, we tend to be a little cautious with pump therapy in those patients. Probably one of the more challenging things, which again makes this pump a little bit different than a regular port, is that the pump can never go empty. And so the pump has to be filled every two weeks, either with chemotherapy or with saline. And so if it goes dry, it goes dead. And so it can patients, um, especially those that are coming from a distance, have to be able to come back to Portland uh, to our center for every two weeks uh, a filling of the of the pump. And so this is why, you know, one of the reasons why this therapy is not necessarily available at all places. All right, so where does the pump fit in? So um, for those of you who are interested, this is actually quite a nice review. Um, I can't believe it's already been two years, but this was um, one of my colleagues, Paul Kara Nicholas, who's in Toronto, wrote this really nice um, um, review article looking at the different regional therapies for liver metastases, including ablation and radiation and pump. Um, and so I just want to kind of set the stage just to give you a sense of where pump therapy lies with the other treatment modalities for the liver. And you'll see here on top, you know, for first line treatment, the randomized trials of pump versus TACE, uh, which is the chemoembolization, and TEAR, which is the radioembolization. And you can see that the response rates, the conversion to resection, and the survival are all significantly better in the pump studies. And recall, these are randomized controlled trials. Then even in the second line setting or in the unresectable setting, you can see again, the HAI trials versus TACE and TEAR with again, very enviable response rates, even in the third line setting, as well as survival. So let's talk the logistics. How do you place these and manage them? So you can see here what a little bit about what the pump looks like and what the pocket looks like. So we typically put these um, subcutaneously. We attach them to the um, rectus fascia. Uh, you can see the mechanism there in the top right. It's really a pretty straightforward, simple design. It's, it's just a bellows system with freon gas. And so you fill the pump and the, the chamber is loaded. And then as soon as you remove the needle, then the, uh, the pump starts emptying the drug. And so what we have to do when we fill it is we have to just use the needle to measure how much there is in the reservoir and then continue to fill it. Um, you can see the placement there on the bottom left where we clear out an area in the gastroduodenal artery. And so we take all the lymphatic tissue there away. And then you can see on the bottom right, we actually test the perfusion of the liver. So that liver that looks blue it didn't look blue before. It's because we put dye, methylene blue, into the pump and then flush it to make sure that both lobes of the liver are lighting up so that we know that there's perfusion to both sides. Just to give you a sense of what the dosing looks like, um, I, to I told you before about the FUDR, how it gets concentrated to almost 400 times the dose. There are other drugs that have been put through there. They just don't have as much of the advantage as far as the uh, concentration of drugs. So even with 5-FU, mitomycin, or oxaliplatin, you're only getting up to five or sometimes tenfold uh, dose increase. But you can see that the, uh, the algorithm, this algorithm came from Dr. Nancy Kemeny, who was at Sloan Kettering, who really kind of pioneered this therapy. You can see there how we use the liver function tests. So the uh, um, AST, ALT, ALKFOS, and bilirubin to guide the dose reductions. Because what we don't want to see is what you see on the left there, which is the biliary sclerosis, uh, that once it, it, it forms, it can be very difficult to manage. Um, and so we also do other preventive strategies like giving uh, dexamethasone with the pump to help prevent the sclerosis and also avoid things like bevacizumab or Avastin. So that's been shown to actually potentiate the, uh, the side effects. I'm going to show this video, which actually comes from the pump company, but uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I have no financial interest in the company, but it just gives you a sense of the tumors that are being perfused by the hepatic artery and growing. And there's a picture of the pump. You can see what it looks like. It's got those little metal fasteners, which is what we use to sew them onto the fascia. You can see the catheter with the rings in there. And so we use those rings to help us place the catheter in the gastroduodenal artery, and then we can attach it. And then you can see there where it lies. It can either be on the left or right side, depending on where our esteemed colorectal surgeons are planning on putting an ostomy. 
we try to go on the other side of that. So we next, like it's good to have a discussion with them up front. And then you can see once the, the therapy is being administered, it really goes to the entire liver. So not just where the cancer is, but it will float around and be perfused to the entire liver. And then again, the hope is that the metastases will uh, respond. And even if they don't respond completely, this is a much more manageable liver to try to take out those two residual lesions as opposed to the initial eight or 10 or 15. This is just more uh, the references down there for the trials. And then again, just giving a sense of what happens to these lesions when you do get a complete response and that chemotherapy nicely shrinks away the tumors and then the liver, which has got regenerative potential can grow back. This is actually a nice paper it came out um, just a couple of years ago from um, a consortium uh, looking at the, again, you can see the diagram there of how the pump is placed, how it's secured. And then you can see again, the methylene blue and even the ICG that we use to confirm bilateral perfusion of the catheter. At the bottom left in panel D, what you'll see is what we don't wanna see. And so you'll see that when that methylene blue goes in, we wanna see blue in the liver but not in the duodenum where the arrow is pointing, because that means that we're having extra hepatic perfusion. So if we were to use that pump and give chemotherapy, the chemotherapy would be going to the stomach and duodenum, and we wanna avoid that scenario. And so how do we avoid that? Well, so we do the methylene blue test in the operating room, and then when the patient's in the, in the hospital, we get a nuclear medicine study. Again, and the nuclear medicine study is to look for the same two things. We wanna see perfusion in the liver, and we don't want to see perfusion outside the liver. And so if you'll see on the panel there, H, you'll see that there appears to be um, uh, some perfusion in the head of the pancreas. And so if that occurs, then we take the patient to interventional radiology where they'll get an angiogram through the pump, and then they will, uh, our IR docs will then uh, embolize that vessel. Uh, and so it kind of gives another check and a balance for um, the perfusion. On the right side, you'll sort of see some of the other potential complications, which include catheter erosions, you know, pocket, pocket infections. Uh, and so these things are rare, but I think as a center, you have to be able to be able to manage these complications when they arise. So for that reason, um, we put together kind of a survey of all the pump centers in the United States. Um, you can see there the majority are clustered around the East Coast and the Midwest. Um, you'll see our center, is here in Portland. Um, this center here in Seattle was where I came from and Dr. Kennecke came from, uh, who's one of our new colorectal uh, GI oncologists. That program is no longer active as both the surgeon and oncologist left to come here. So uh, we are the only program in the Northwest and really only a handful of programs, four or five west of Texas, you know, serving the, the Western half of the United States. So it's really a big area. When we actually then asked all the centers kind of what are the barriers and the considerations um, you'll see that these are kind of the order of things so obviously you need a surgeon you need a medical oncologist but we don't want to underestimate the need for nursing for nuclear medicine for pharmacy radiology gi and so forth and you know certainly some things that we've run into has been some regulatory barriers some device issues drug access so there's lots of things to consider when starting this program all right, so what are the indications? So I really want to, um, you know, start with this paper. Um, this is actually from the New England Journal in 1999. And Dr. Sikoris will, will recognize the third author, Al Cohen, who uh, I think she worked with very closely uh, in a previous life. Um, and so this was really the one that put this uh, therapy on the map. So this is, again, looking at combined therapy of HAI with, uh, at the time, was just systemic 5-FU versus monotherapy with 5-FU. And you can see, again, the benefit of using combined therapy for progression-free survival, which was the endpoint. It was interesting because then even looking at uh, overall survival, the combined therapy uh, appeared to have the benefit over single therapy alone. I think, you know, obviously one of the criticisms is that this is, you know, not modern chemotherapy, but it is, you know, the update that they published in 2005 still showed that benefit uh, in PFS that was significant and OS was less significant. So what about as we move through time? So this is now 2010. This is now outside of Sloan Kettering. So this is through the NCCTG and NSABP. So, you know, um, this is our cooperative groups in the United States. 
Again, you'll see the benefit here. This was uh, a single phase, a single arm trial. Patients now with um, more modern systemic therapy with Oxali, Platin, and CAPE, 88% uh, alive at two years, which was the primary endpoint. Uh, looking at, again, a more modern cohort, again, this is retrospective, though, looking at Sloan Kettering data, really all things benefit with HAI and systemic therapy. So disease-specific survival, hepatic uh, progression-free survival, and overall progression-free survival, uh, all with that trend. Um, this is probably the most, the more modern, um, the most modern retrospective series. So almost 2,400 consecutive patients of which 785 with HAI and 1,500 without. The, the vast majority, almost all, had modern systemic therapy. This was a propensity score analysis. And you'll see an overall five-year survival, again, with metastatic disease to deliver of 43%, and even a 10-year survival of 29%. Um, and so the median OS for the HAI patients was 67 months versus 44 months for those with systemic alone. And you might think that this is, you know, for patients who had the worst disease, that HAI has the best. But interestingly, the patients that had no negative primaries and very low clinical risk scores had the best outcomes. So I think this is a little bit of a um, perhaps surprising findings that those that had even, you know, what we think of sort of clearable disease um, would benefit from additional HAI therapy in the adjuvant setting. I'm not going to ask you to look through all these, but I just want you to look at this is now a, a, a big meta analysis um, from several studies, uh, randomized and non. If you just focus to the uh, forest plot there on the right side, you can see that both um, in the uh, overall survival setting and the progression free survival setting, um, HAI is favored by this meta analysis. So that's the adjuvant setting. What about for unresectable disease? This is where people really think it's got the most benefit. So again, looking at randomized trials, this time from CALGB. And the, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing about this trial is that it was actually done as HAI versus systemic therapy. So a little bit of apples to oranges. Uh, but interestingly, this did, again, confirm that there was a benefit to HAI therapy over systemic therapy. And so, um, and, you know, this was not just a study from New York City, so it did include patients from all over the country. Um, this is a, a study from the University of Pittsburgh, retrospective, but again, same thing, looking at that combination um, of HI with systemic therapy uh, associated with uh, a benefit. What about conversion? I think this is what, you know, us as the surgeons are really interested in, is can we convert patients? And so, this is uh, Sloan Kettering data, looking at 25% of patients that were initially unresectable were then converted after the combination of HAI and systemic therapy. Meeting time of conversion was seven months of treatment. And you can see that in the converted patients, the survival was vastly different, 59 months versus 16 months, and the five-year survival of 47 versus 6%. You know, of those patients, 35 had no evidence of the disease and 24 were still alive with the disease. You know, the predictive factors, as you can imagine, is patients who, again, were chemotherapy naive, uh, who had a, a low clinical risk score, and those kind of in the later end of the treatment strategy. But what about prospective data? So this was actually a, a nice prospective trial, phase two, looking at um, 49 unresectable patients that were reviewed uh, at tumor board. You can see what the technical and the biologic criteria were for unresectability. And these patients underwent treatment with HAI and the best systemic therapy. And the study was powered to increase resectability from a historical 15% to 30%, so doubling the resectability. Um, and so you can see that the overall response rate was 76%, 36 patients with a partial response, one with a complete response. And so this trial kind of blew it out of the water because 47% of patients were resected. So almost half of patients who were traditionally thought as being unresectable were converted by the pump therapy. They actually did a landmark analysis to, to, to again, try to exclude some of the bias for patients who survived. Uh, and again, median OS of 46 patients, 17 patients alive, nine still with no evidence of disease. And interestingly, the number of tumors, but not their KRAS status, was predictive of, of long-term survival. 
So what's been our experience at OHSU? Just to give you a sense, the program here started in 2016. You can see there on the top left, the different centers um, that started programs, uh, typically with folks who trained at Sloan Kettering and then, for lack of a better word, metastasized to other cities in the United States. Um, and you can see our initial experience with 11 patients. Um, you have a sense there of what the response rates were, how many went to resection and the survival. Dr. Sky Mayo, who's our, uh, who runs our hepatic artery program, then published our individual series, not as a group. You can see there are the first 21 patients, of which 15 were unresectable, six were actually used as adjuvant therapy. Um, we did notice you know, a biliary toxicity rate of 24%, but really we were very strict in that definition, and really only three patients required stenting, which was the, uh, um, the official uh, uh, complication. Uh, definition. And the reason for that is it really takes a team. And so this is just gives you a sense of all the different teams that are involved in the pump program. And so and obviously there is the, the surgical oncologist, the colorectal surgeon, the medical oncologist, but you got to really look at everybody else, including the infusion nursing, the social worker, the inpatient nursing and the pharmacy. And it really takes all these people working together to make this program work. So to give you a sense of where we are now, and this is actually as of um, June of last year, um, we started in 2016, as I mentioned. We last year we put in the, uh, 13 pumps, which was the record number for us. Um, to date, we put in 59 pumps, and I think, as far as I heard from Dr. Mayo, we're up to over 70 pumps now. Um, you can see that the majority of the indications was for colorectal liver metastases. But the bars in orange are for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. carcinoma. And the reason you can see it's uptick um, uh, more recently is that we actually have some uh, prospective trials for cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma as well. This is actually our website on the OHSU uh, open website. So please feel free to peruse this. Uh, it's an open site and you can have an idea of what, um, uh, uh, of what our program can offer. More recently, Isaac Schwantes, who's one of our, our residents, presented our modified dosing protocol at the Society of Surgical Oncology. And as I take you from this uh, summary slide from left to right, we've been doing a modified dosing protocol where we're, we're trying to reduce the dose to prevent complications. And as you can see here, by reducing the dose and preventing treatment interruptions, we're actually delivering more therapy overall to patients. So we're not only giving them more cycles, but we're giving them more days of treatment. And despite that, we've actually had less treatment modifications and also preserved the conversion rate to resection. And so you can actually see that it went from 20% to 33%. So in fact, it's not statistically significant, but we've increased the patients that have been able to go to resection despite modifying the dose. So where do we go in the future? I think one thing that hasn't been very obvious is how molecular profiles have affect pump therapy. You know, as a general gist, we think that, you know, pump therapy can overcome some of these, but it turns out that obviously patients who have more low risk mutations do better. So those who do have wild type P53 and wild type RAS and RAF, we're able to convert more of those patients to resectability. Um, and so this is just in the infancy, you know, just now as we talked about profiling cancers more often, We'll find out more information about which ones would benefit from pump more or less. What is exciting is that in the US, we're going to have the first um, large scale randomized trial using modern chemotherapy and pump therapy. So, this is the ECOG Akron 2222. Um, it's being run out of um, Duke University, uh, but Dr. Mayo is actually the national SWOG champion for this trial here at OHSU. And the idea here is that we're going to take patients who have unresectable disease after uh, three to six cycles of chemo, sorry, six and 12 cycles of chemotherapy, and then they'll get randomized to placing of a pump versus continuing the same chemotherapy. And we will then look for the primary endpoint, which is overall survival. It's an exciting time to, to talk about HAI because you can see here the number of centers that are, have this program is just dramatically increasing. Ever since you know, the early uh, uh, 20 to 2010, 2011. 
These are actually part of our uh, HII consortium. And so these is actually international uh, sites as well. You'll see Zurich on there. You'll see uh, Mexico City, Erasmus. And so this really therapy that's here to stay. I want to just summar summarize things and then, you know, be happy to take questions. I hope I've showed you that HAI therapy uh, kind of continues to provide benefit in all settings, both resectable and unresectable. Um, it does require some significant effort and investment um, and future treatments we may base on genomic data. I think what we don't know is the optimal treatment sequencing with other therapies. And then how to incorporate, as Dr. Sikaris knows, now that we have a lot of watch and wait strategies, particularly for rectal cancer, is how do we decide where to put the pump in that scenario? And then in the future, can we deliver other agents? You know, we've been giving the same drug through the pump for several years, but would immunotherapy, for example, perhaps be more effective when it's concentrated into the liver? We don't know that, uh, that answer. I really want to be, you know, appreciate my colleagues. We have a very active GI tumor board. Uh, you can see here it's represented by several people, including surgery, uh, 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 surgical oncology, colorectal surgery, transplant surgery, radiology, pathology, uh, and it really works as a team effort. That's all I had, and I'm happy to take the slides down and take any questions. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. I have a friend who have who doesn't have the colorectal cancer, but have the higher organs such as pancreas with some liver. Will this kind of treatment benefit other organ that you have yeah. heard about? So, so, you know, the best data we have is in colorectal cancer. You know, unfortunately, it has not been used in things like pancreas cancer or let's say gastric or esophageal cancer, typically because those cancers tend to spread not only to the liver, but elsewhere. And so it really has not been used um, for those metastases. It has been used, as I mentioned, for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, again, but it has to be confined to the liver. And so for, you know, uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma that's even multifocal or unresectable, there's actually good data to support pump therapy. Um, more recently, there was a randomized trial out of China, I believe, looking at HCC, but that was with HAI infusion and not the pump. And so, um, um, you know, we don't quite have that here in the US because um, obviously China has a much higher population of HCC than we see. Um, so, but that potentially may be the next site where we use this is HCC. Thank you. Um, you mentioned sure. cholangiocarcinoma and I have the mm -hmm. Bangkok Hospital Korat team, which I believe that they have seen quite a lot. Um, anyone mm -hmm. from BKS would like to ask him about this? Free doctor, uh, I'm a uh, nurse, cancer nurse coordinator today. So sorry today we have not a uh, doctor for 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 listening today. So sorry. My, 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 okay, <laughs> uh, from from the nurse experience, um, the current cholangiocarcinoma, how it was treated there at Kurata. Okay. Yes, ERCP, something like that. Okay. So, Prof, um, anyway, we will schedule you to perhaps visit Bangkok Hospital Kora because uh, in Northeastern Thailand, is quite prevalent for cholangiocarcinoma related with some kind of parasite because they have a habit of eating raw feet, raw yeah. fish there. So, so you may have some good discussion sharing about this interested topic you mentioned. Um, what to know, Sotka, any question from you for Prof? Uh, good. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Sarinda from Watanoso. So I'm very interested uh, about the pump and we never use the pump at Watanoso here. And I'm uh, interested in that if we use the pump for uh, our liver metastasis, 
do we need to uh, receive uh, systemic therapy also? A great question. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's what I wanted. I hope it was it was it was clear. Yeah, typically we treat folks with both pump and systemic therapy because the pump only goes to the liver, and so we do want to make sure that we the systemic therapy will take care of any micro microscopic disease that's systemic. Now, in patients who've had a lot of systemic disease, I mean, systemic therapy, and don't have any evidence of um, a disease after they finish their systemic treatment. We sometimes just place them on maintenance therapy with the pump uh, because, again, the side effects are very, very low. There's no systemic side effects from the pump. We just have to make sure that their pump gets filled and keep an eye on their liver function. So we typically start with both HAI and systemic and then eventually peel away the systemic. Hope that answered your question. Okay, so I, I recognize that uh, the pump has a uh, benefit maybe maximum benefit to conversion from unresectable uh, liver metastasis to uh, resectable liver metastasis and after that when we resect the liver liver already so then after uh, operation we can continue systemic therapy as you suggest yes and in fact Dr. Sikinis and I, you know, share a patient where he uh, had resection, but had, you know, 15 lesions with very high risk for recurrence. And so we did the resection and then put a pump in. Dr. Sikinis took out the, uh, the colon, or I think it was colon, yeah, rectum, sorry, rectum. And then he unfortunately developed a recurrence in his liver. And so we now put him back on HAI therapy. Okay, thank you. Dr. Woodka, I have seen you back. This hepatic arterial pump, you have any thought on this? So, I just entered the meeting, sorry, I, I, I don't have the detail. But technically, uh, how you put the catheter into the, the river, percutaneous or can we use a percutaneously or by operation? It's a good question. Yeah. So we typically it, it does re require an operation because the catheter has to go into the gastroduodenal artery, and so we have to actually you know so we clear away about two centimeters from the insertion of the gastroduodenal to the to the uh, common hepatic artery. We take away all the lymph nodes and the tissues there because again we don't want to have any extra hepatic perfusion. And then I typically park the catheter right at the T junction of the GDA with the with the common hepatic, um, and then the pump has to then be secured to the abdominal wall. And so we typically do do this via kind of a small laparotomy, although it has been described to also be put in robotically. And so we're actually working on that protocol now to be able to do it minimally invasively. That typically works better for the cholangio patients because they're not having any resection. But in the colorectal folks, they're typically getting their primary tumor removed. And so that's why, you know, sometimes it's just easier to do with the mini laparotomy. Although our colorectal surgeons are very skilled at minimally invasive colon procedures. And so again, it'd be nice to be able to offer it through smaller incisions. Mm, thank you very much. So you see, in Thailand, we don't have the, the pump. I have some experience about putting the character from uh, the gastrointestinal artery, but we use the the light the port a cat the arterial port a cat, so we cannot use the use the pump in Thailand now. We hope that we can get some pump from from uh, SSU in the future. We'll, we'll sneak some in the luggage. No, I think as you said, it's it's the uh, you know it's the regulatory and we, you know the pump that we hear also is not the same thing used in Europe. So they're different pumps, uh, but there is data as you said uh, with percutaneous infusion. It's just that you know we basically need to come in and catheters put in all the time, and we don't know if the kinetics are the same. You're getting you know, the, the benefit of the pump is you're getting a constant infusion. So we think it may be a little better, but there's not a lot of other comparisons. 
Prof. Thank um, you. So, sorry, I think the, the voice is a bit uh, blur accidentally. Can you repeat the 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 few sentences, the last sen few sentences for us again? Yeah, no, the last, it's basically, I think, you know, I think we were talking about just percutaneous um, infusion to the, to the liver, which I think is doable. There are some studies showing the benefit there, including the the study that I mentioned from China and HCC. But what we don't know is which one is better because the pump allows for continuous infusion over two weeks, as opposed to getting a, a bolus through a percutaneous access. Um, and there, there's no direct comparison between the two. But in terms of doses between the bolus and the continued uh, infusion, total doses, will that be the same or with the pump is less? It's a good question. We don't do the percutaneous infusion, so I don't know what the dosages there are that, that, that are used. Um, um, and it, there's not a lot of prospective data uh, in that regard. Well, there's actually a fair amount that I, I think hopefully I reviewed on the pump that's prospective. Thank you. Uh, good to Dr. Pitulak or Dr. Vinita, any question? Um, based on your experience, um, your team inserted this kind um, for some amount of patients, right? What about complications after that? I mean, we're messing with the vessel. So is there any like thrombosis or anything as a maybe like long-term complication? Yeah, the, the big thing we worry about, as I mentioned, is the biliary sclerosis. So we have to be very, very careful by following the liver function test. And if they start to go up, we usually have to do some dose reductions or even hold therapy. We also give dexamethasone along with the therapy to try to prevent the biliary sclerosis because sometimes it can be severe enough to require stenting. And then if that's the case, then we can no longer um, use pump therapy. And patients always ask me, how long do I keep this device, right? Because the issue is it's got to get filled every two weeks with something, either heparin or drug. And it's it's interesting. Some patients who you know do well want it want it removed right away. Um, others kind of look at it as their insurance policy. It's like a little reminder that they have something there to take care of their cancer should it come back. The challenge is if we remove it, just so you know, we don't have to go back into the abdomen. We just open the incision on the abdominal wall. We then have to. Uh, disconnect the catheter, we tie it off, and then we dunk it into the belly. But that means that patient can no longer have HII infusion ever again. So it is a big decision. Once, once, once you take it out, that's it. You can't have it back. So it's a one-time experience, right? <laughs> one-time experience. So that's why we're very careful about maintaining it. Um, yeah. And that's why, again, it, it's difficult to, to have this at, at many centers, right? And so what we've tried to do, because Oregon is, is, you know, a big state as well, and folks have to travel a long distance, is we're trying to see if we can set up some gas stations in different parts around the state where they can at least get filled with some saline or heparin, right? So they don't have to come into Portland. And we recently, I recently put a pump in a patient from Alaska. So you can imagine the challenge is there to those patients have to fly down every two weeks um, for their fills. Yeah, quite far. Agree. Thank you. Uh, any comment from you, Chan Pitulak? Uh, yeah, one question, please. Uh, I would like to know if, if, if this procedure is feasible for every general surgeon or has to be the hepatobiliary uh, surgeon? Yeah, I, I think just given all the new, it's not particularly difficult, but it's very nuanced because again, you have to be able to separate those tissues. The catheter has to be placed in just in the right direction. You have to know how to manage the complications that I, you know, typically it's um, hepatobiliary surgeons that, that put them in. And I would say even not all hepatobiliary surgeons know how to put them in. And so this is something that's, I think it's not just the operation. For example, we we follow these patients with their chemotherapy, so they're always seen by medical oncology as well as surgical oncology. 
I had some questions. I'm Dr. Puchai, medical oncologist from Community Wave Hospital. Thank you for your exciting lecture. Because we have no experience about it, so have I have too many questions, but I would like to ask you three questions today. Sure. Number, number one, uh, because we have a lot of uh, colon cancer with liver metastasis, but from, from, from your lecture, you don't have much patience. So what's the obstacle? the obstacle of this technique. Sorry, I want to make sure I understand your question right. So you're saying that for your patients that you have with liver metastases, you're, you're typically not requiring any downstaging because they are resectable or that I misunderstood? I, I, I said, um, you, you have a lot of patients that use this kind of technique or not? How, 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 how oh. many? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, like I said, we, we, we put in about 70 of these at this point. I would say that the highest volume center it's it's Sloan Kettering is probably putting in, you know, one a week. So they're probably putting in 50 um, uh, a year to put those in. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, if, again, they are a referral center for, from the entire East Coast and they have the most experience. Like I said, I think we're also very careful about the patient selection. So we're not gonna, even though somebody might be a candidate, this is why I'm, uh, we have the social workers work with them because sometimes there's financial challenges, um, you know, uh, uh, social challenges. And so we really are very careful in what patients we put these in. We wanna make sure they're able to travel back and forth to Portland and be able to manage um, some of the nuances here. The other thing that I didn't mention is because the pump uses um you know it's a bellows and freon it's very susceptible to changes in temperature and altitude and so sometimes we tell patients who have this that you have to be very careful when you go into hot tubs or even go swim because it could change the emptying of the pump um and those that you know spend a lot of time at altitude usually if you take a flight that's okay but if you live at a very high altitude it may affect how much the pump is releasing. So you may have to change the intervals that you have to fill in. Now my, my other question, in, in your experience, which setting that is most benefit or most effective with this kind of, of, of treatment? And you know, have any idea about the cost of, of, of this treatment? Yeah, I think if I hear you right, we probably, the scenario we use this the most is in the unresectable settings. And so, you know, patients who have 15, 20 lesions spread all over the liver, um, but they have liver confined disease, because we know this is where the pump will have the most benefit. But we're always looking to see who we can convert. And so, at, usually at the time of pump placement, we always usually try to resect maybe clear one side of the liver. Because that way, if we get enough response, we can then go back and resect the, the remaining tumors on the other side. And like I said, in the Sloan Kettering experience, they got almost half of patients converted. Um, we don't have that experience yet, but we're hoping to get there. Thank you very much. Next, Pataya, any question from you? Pataya, any question? No question, ka. Um, cola, ka. And by Dr. Ton, Paya Thai Song, ka. Any question from you? Yes, thank you, Dr. Vanapa. I would like to ask about the, uh, uh, this procedure that that for the neoadjuvant treatment for downsizing tumor at the liver metastatic. I think some lesion will disappear. Some lesion will be smaller than we can resection. Uh, how should we do about the lesion that disappear? We need to resect it or not? That's a fantastic question because we see this frequently. And so what's interesting about that is that the small lesions that disappear with synthetic therapy sometimes disappear not because of the one, but the liver is more steep. So we almost always get Therapy, because I can really tell you whether that is there or not. Interesting, there's been studies done to look at what we disappear. And it's been said so residual chicken cancer there. 
Hi, Prof. Sorry, I think the microphone got blurry again. Can you can you repeat this one more time? Sorry, it's, it's bird sound. <laughs> Flavio, I think it's the internet connection. Can you stop? It the might video? Be. I'm going to stop my video. Is this yeah, better? Stop, stop the video and I'm going to stop mine as well. We may hear. Is this better? This is better. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that. So, just to answer your question, uh, again, with disappearing lesions, um, with systemic therapy, we know that 80% of the time there's still cancer there. But with HAI therapy, if they disappear, only 20% is viable cancer. And so we tend to observe in HAI the disappearing lesions and then only treat them if they come back. Thank you. Hopefully and may, <laughs> yes, may, may I have another question, please? Uh, for this, this technique about the hepatic artery infusion pump uh, for the colorectal cancer metastasis, and how about the, your opinion about the from the other side or primary at the other organ go to the liver is useful or not? Sorry, I I, I didn't think I, I heard that question properly. So you said you said primary other side that not colon cancer. Maybe oh, some, yes, yeah, yes, yes, correct. Yeah, so with, with esophageal cancer, pancreas cancer, we have not used this therapy because, again, the it doesn't respond as well to, to systemic therapy, and there's usually extra hepatic disease. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ka. Um, any other question from other side, from the south, anything? Kunpiyanut? Um, uh, Paranika from the clinical nurse specialist viewpoint, any question for the speaker? Kunparani, me come to me, ha, Likun Meta. Okay, I don't, I don't have any question. Huh? Okay, I have. Uh, I have a little bit more regarding the nursing care after this pump is in. Is that complicated, or it it does it require to be only clinical nurse care only, or the general nurse can handle that? Yeah, training? it's a great question. Great question. So our oncology, you know, our usual HII patients go to our oncology floor. Um, you know, the, there's not any specific nursing care. Per se, it's just that, you know, if there's an incision and a wound, but the tricky become the trick is the infusion nurses. I think that they're the ones that need this expertise about putting the needle into the chamber. And so this is why we, you know, is, is the infusion nursing that's really um, the special expertise, but for the regular clinical nurses on the floor, there's really not much, much more needed expertise wise. And you mentioned about having to deal with this pump for two weeks, every two weeks, right? Um, yep. When you go out to, I mean, for the plan to reach out to the community, uh, what is in your plan right now? Um, kind of nurse that will go, go out or what kind of professional do you plan to bring out to, to handle this matter? No, so the patients go home, you know, when they go home, they go home. They don't need any special nursing care. They just have to come back to the infusion unit every two weeks for their fill. No, I, you, you mentioned about 
remember you try to minimize the patient flying in from that far or traveling to OHSU. So you kind of mentioned that you have a plan like every two weeks to infuse something, heparin or water yes. or something. So yes, what exactly. kind of professional yeah, so would do that? General that nurse would be or? Another, no, that would be at, at an infusion center. So what we're trying to do in Oregon is because Portland sits at the north end of the state, and it's a big state. There are a couple other cities, you know, like in central Oregon and southern Oregon, where we're trying to partner with the cancer centers there with their infusion units. So that, yeah, so that, so that if the patients can't make it up to Portland, they can at least get filled, you know, with heparin and saline, not drug. And and the person who does that is the, is the, the cancer uh, the cancer doctor, right? Exactly. Yes, it, we, oh. it's with the oncologist and the infusion nurses at those cancer centers. Okay, I'm clear now. Thank you very much. Sure. Sorry about um, that. Uh, no worry. Any any other question? We still have some minutes. I have. I. We can is, have, huh? uh, is this farm covering body insurance in the U.S.? So the insurance. The insurance question is always interesting. Um, the pump has been around for a long time. So that's usually not a I'm, I'm sorry, cut the yard ties off, huh? Okay, I'm going to call this, huh? Hello, I'm going to call this, huh? Um, sorry, Kat, can you repeat the question again? For the yeah, question is about, about the insurance covering for this pump. Is the U.S. insurance covering for this? Yeah, so typically, you know, the pump therapy is well approved. And so sometimes on occasion, we'll get some insurance companies that won't cover the device, but the operation is, is usually covered. And then, of course, the infusion is covered um, in the US. And so, you know, you know, we, we have a very good, you know, regulatory and compliance team that goes over that. Sometimes it takes a few bone calls to make it happen. But um, typically, most insurance companies are now familiar with this therapy. Interestingly, in Canada, it's only available through a clinical trial. And so we've had a couple of patients from Canada that have come down to get the pump placed here. And then we've had to work with the Canadian um, Ministry of Health to get the approvals for them to pay for. It. I have a, a, a one, one last question. Uh, when we review the chemo, the nurse, nurse give it a doctor to fully on the chemo? Nope, the, the nurse, the infusion nurses can give the chemo. And it not, not, not much complication. It's not, not difficult to, to inject, right? No, that's the, no, the, they have to train the nurses about how to put the needle into the pump because it's, it's similar to a port, but not quite the same. So our nurses have special training to do that, but it's something that can be taught. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very, very much. It's very advanced therapy today we learn and there's a lot of questions asking to Prof Fabio and we can certainly continue, can continue more in person when he's here in November. Thank you very yeah, much, and, everyone. Very yeah, great. and then certainly if the Thai team that's coming here wants to take a look, we are happy to have them come into the operating room and see a pump or see a pump patient, how they're getting filled. So please let us know when you come visit here. Thank you. I, I'm Dr. Sarinda. Yeah, I'm planning for that. Flavia, I'm counting on you because there's a surgical oncologist coming. And I was thinking maybe on a Monday, they can see us do a synchronous resection with a pump. That yes. Was... Okay. Yeah, I'm planning for that. That's how we are. Um, and definitely, uh, it can be a pet imaging specialist to come. Uh, we are will accommodate. I'll just have to talk to the radiology team, and they'll have the couple of days to spend time on different imaging. Absolutely, Flavia. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Presentation. Thanks, Flavio. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.